Taking Care of Your Business is a series of programs to help small businesses succeed in Scottsdale. This program is presented by Scottsdale's Economic Development Department at 2 p.m. the first Friday of each month in the Eureka Loft, a free collaborative workspace at the Scottsdale Civic Center Library. Learn how to take care of your business at ChooseScottsdale.com. Well, let me tell a little bit story about us. Uh, Paul Winslow um, started 40 years ago a very successful architectural firm. And after practicing and learning a lot of techniques about design, he realized that he had honed some skills that are extremely valuable in terms of design thinking. And so when he had the option of retiring from his previous firm, he decided, we're also married, he decided that we're gonna, let's go ahead and start a new business that is more about people and that is trying to show and share sort of what we learn in terms of design and how it can help others with their businesses. And that's how Winslow Partners started. Well, and obviously the boss of the firm, Callie Mota, actually started her career in Mexico. She uh, studied architecture down there, didn't quite finish her degree, uh, came to the States, worked in the construction industry for a number of years uh, met me and I suggested it was time to go back and get her degrees. So she went back to ASU and got her undergraduate and graduate degrees in architecture and uh, again when I decided that uh, it was time to step out of a very large firm and get back to where we could do what I loved most. Uh, we started uh, Winslow and Partners but we started as Callie said with the idea that we're focusing as much as we can on people and people's needs and, and assisting people uh, in, in their endeavors, whatever they, that is at this point. So basically in our practice, we're really interested in the changes that are occurring in the world. And that has to do with design thinking. And why is that important, right? I mean, well, because not only the world is changing, but technology is changing how we live, how we do things at an even faster speed. So what is design thinking, really? Uh, the best way to explain design thinking is it happens in a very loose way on a whiteboard or a blackboard. And it's basically a process that combines creative and critical thinking. And the idea is to generate innovative solutions to any given business problem or situation. There are a few quotes that I would like to read, um, some taken from Forbes magazine, others from Harvard Business Review, because these are the um, kind of the forefront of business and they're saying design thinking is the way to go for the future. Um, so Forbes magazine says a primary element of design thinking is simply thinking and ideating on a solution to address a problem or better meet a customer need. Then Tim Brown from IDEO says on a Harvard Business Review magazine, thinking like a designer can transform the way you develop products, services, processes, and even strategy. Then another article uh, on globalization and new opportunities says, to succeed in the world's new markets, being immersed in them, tailoring offerings to meet the exact needs of local customers, forming close relationships with local officials and community will help them better compete with companies of all sizes and from all geographies. So who can use design thinking? Well, basically anyone. Any business person who wants to uh, create a solution for a new product, for a service, for a new process, and uh, in a nutshell, anything that you would like to see improved. We're gonna explain now how we do the innovation think tank or how we do the design thinking process for a business. And Paul is gonna start talking about that. You know, it's, as we first started putting this together uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the thing that was really fascinating for me was, ha again, having done this kind of thinking for 20 years or so, trying to describe it is, is so difficult uh, until you kind of illustrate it. And, and what I realized early on was 
we don't have the answers. What we have is a process. And that the success of the process is, when you get finished, the people you're working with say, well, I knew that. Which means that they really did, it's just they have to take the step back and rethink how they're going to do what they're going to do using the tools they already have. Okay, so the idea that it's a, it's a business decision-making strategy or process that will help you increase productivity, create new products and so forth, as, as Kelly said. But it really, the most important piece of it is starting out to identify what the problem really is. Why are, you, why are you doing it? What is it you're really trying to accomplish? All too often, we have a tendency to, under, to, to be able to articulate how we do it, and particularly, specifically what we do, but why we do it and how we come to the decision of making uh, the business decisions and strategies that we do, a lot of times we just sort of take it in what is traditionally a very linear pattern. And so we usually illustrate this by, by the puzzle because if you're really trying to do things in our traditional way of, of thinking, we've all been taught a, a pretty much a linear approach. And the idea would be that it's just like a puzzle, you have all these parts and you sort of know what these parts are. So you start to take each part and you try and figure out how to make it better. And by the time you get through, you end up with another puzzle that's better. The question is, is it better for the right reasons? Is it better to the extent it could be? And so our, our uh, approach to this is, trying to get people to think outside the box, to think differently. So the, the thesis of this really comes down to the first question you need to ask is one taking a step back. You have an idea of what it is you're trying to do, um, but the idea is to try and take a step back and think of how else you could do it. The example I always use, everyone understands schools because most all of us went to school at some point. So if I were starting a new business that was a charter school, First thing I would traditionally would do is say, okay, um, I want to have about 500 kids. There'd be high school. I want to be STEM because that's in. So that means they need a biology room. Then how do I make the best biology room? That's the traditional linear way of thinking. Our approach is to take the step back. So the first kind of questions that we would ask as an illustration would be, how do we learn? or other examples of where we learn. And if we agree not to use the traditional nomenclature of classroom, but the nomenclature of learning space or learning environment, all of a sudden that could be at the zoo, it could be outside, it could be in the shopping mall, it could be any place. So all of a sudden you have available to you a whole series of options that people are now looking at for creating learning environments. A lot of charter schools, I mean, there's one in Minneapolis that's next to a zoo and they practically live in the zoo. There's another one that's in a shopping mall. And so there are lots of other ways that, that a school can be made. And so then you come up with this whole plethora of, of ideas, all of which have the same criteria that you would have in the traditional way of thinking, but you have the ability to step back and create this nonlinear, iterative, multi-opportunity uh, approach. The point is you have to center on your customer. And if, you, if you're talking about a school and a classroom, you're talking about the administration and the teacher. If you're talking about a learning environment, you're talking about the student. And so part of it is getting people to take the step backwards and figure out who it is and what it is they're really trying to do. So the idea is that you create all these different options. They have all the same pieces that the puzzle had, but they take all kinds of different shapes and forms and, and approaches. And so you start to sort through and figure out all the different ways you can do it. Not trying to qualify them, you just kind of brainstorm on different ways that you can do it. And, and, and part of the, the way we do it is we use a whiteboard and we just, we just start in one corner and work our way across and start putting up ideas and, and what we found is that by doing that, everyone to some degree is visual. And so by putting up a list over here and a little diagram here and a timeline there and a something, people start making connections they don't do just by having the written word. So we use that a lot. And then we start looking at each of one of the variations that we come up with. And we start to run them through a, a series of filters. Each, each project is different. 
you know, maybe social patterns, it could be financial, it could be any one of another regulations, Technology. all the things that you need to do to qualify. In which case, you look at all of these different iterations and start to run them through the filter, and pretty soon you find that, well, this one doesn't really work, but this part of it is good. So let's, and you start filtering out and putting together a package that creates a, a totally new way of looking at things. And the idea is, you can do this very quickly. This is not something that takes months. This is an idea to filter things through pretty quickly. Now, you can take it on down the process and, and do the filtering and do the, the pre-qualifications and so forth and take as much time as it takes to get through all the numbers and all of those things. But the idea is you've taken a fresh look, you've rethought about what you're trying to do, and you're, so you're starting out with a slightly different perspective on what it is that you're coming out with. So you fine tune all of those pieces and then you can go into the whatever your traditional way of doing things. I mean, I always like the fish boning to figure out if I do this, I need to do this to get to that and then I work my way down or timelines or flow charts of whatever kind. And so you have then figured out a whole bunch of options. You've figured out one that seems like it starts to rise to the top. Then you start to put it into the processes that are a more normal linear uh, approach. And the idea is that you probably come up with a, a different solution but more importantly, you come up with it quickly and you come up with it from a totally different vantage point. And so you, you sort of pick a winner and the probability is you're gonna have the same pieces, but it's gonna take a totally different form. It's gonna, it's gonna be more three-dimensional, it's gonna be more holistic, it's gonna actually be maybe in a slightly different direction. An example I use, we were talking about this in the office uh, as we were preparing this and we were talking to a couple of people there and I was saying, uh, somebody had asked me, well, you know, you know, can I do this for myself and figure out? And I said, well, yeah, we did this for a friend who had all these idyllic aspirations. She wanted to teach, she wanted to, she had all these things she wanted to do. But as we started looking through all the things that she wanted to do, one of the things that was critical to her, she and her husband played golf. Well, part of what they were talking about doing was doing something in Mexico, with working with people and language and so forth, Mexico doesn't have any golf courses. By the time she got through, all of a sudden, this one priority as she started filtering it through changed her direction. And so some of the other things then took priority. And so it's the idea that you can sort through pretty quickly on evaluating where you stand with uh, the parts and pieces. Well, and to illustrate this process, we have a couple of examples that we would like to share. One is a success and one is a failure. The success is based on a project that IDEO did for Shimano, which is a manufacturing, Japanese manufacturing, manufacturing company that does mountain bikes and racing bikes. And they were noticing that in their American market, their sales had flattened and they wanted to kind of understand what was happening or what new product they could come up with. What this company, IDEO, uh, did, they started doing some research and they found out that there was a market uh, segment market in, in the United States, uh, the boomers that didn't buy bikes because they were intimidating by the image of, you know, the helmets, all the gears, all the um, um, spandex, whatnot. So they did some um, some more research. They realized they could have some. Um, potential users to help them ideate a new, uh, uh, a new product. And what they found out was that the boomers wanted something that was easy to ride with no gears, no handle brakes, and a wider, more comfortable seat, something that resembled what they used to ride when they were little, um, and, but with modern technology. Part of it is, again, it's the idea of looking at your customer and figuring out who you are and where you are, what you want to do, what you're about, and, and what they will do. One of the big failures is in the uh, 1800s, the railroads were king. Transcontinental uh, Railroad or whatever, they had stops all the way across the country. They had hotels related to their, to their stops. 
Along came the Wright brothers flying at Kitty Hawk. It took a while for them to generate, but not very long, to start to get to the point where it started becoming commercial. The failure was the railroad industry thought they were the railroad industry and didn't realize they were in the transportation business. Somebody else came along and started putting airlines together and if the railroads had realized they were in the transportation business, not the railroad business, they already had a network. They had hotels, they had reservations, they had everything it takes to run an air, uh, an air company. And so they just missed a chance. Now, the railroads have slid a little bit over time. A lot of them have disappeared. Uh, airplanes have taken off. They have started, well, what I'm asking you is you have to look and see who you are and what you're about, and you can take the step backwards and then re-visualize what it is you could be to take advantage of where you are. Okay, so at this point, what we would like to do is to say, it's your turn. And we're actually gonna do a very short form just an illustration of how this works. So we're gonna turn off the projector mm -hmm. and we're gonna wheel over the whiteboard and we're gonna start actually trying to put together a little think tank session. We're gonna pretend like you're all in her food business. Food business where you're starting. Absolutely. Okay, and so you guys can have some discussions amongst yourselves and we'll put them up here and we'll kind of sort through them. But the idea being that, okay, so food, whoops, if I could write. I should let Callie actually do this because she writes better and spells better. Okay, so now the real question is, why do you want to do this? What is it about food are you, and I'm going to kind of throw things out here to kind of keep things moving. Is it because you want to have better nutrition for people? You want to have people have gourmet experience? You want to have uh, something quick and easy? You want, I mean, what is it that you're, what, what problem are you trying to solve for the public? Why are you doing this? I'm taking simple recipes and adding herbs and spices to increase the flavor of, of the food. Okay, so your goal is to provide food that has better flavor. Yes. Okay, now, with that goal, you're trying to meet, you're trying to reach a, uh, an audience who's looking for better flavored foods. Yes. Okay, so then the question becomes. Who's the audience? Pardon? Who's the audience, no? Who's the audience? Oh, well, yeah, let, I mean, there, there are two, two integral pieces. To who are you going to, to, to send? And how are you going to to meet that. So, and again, each time we do this, it, it, it's, it's totally different. We do it on the fly, but you get to get the premise of it. Okay, so whose needs are you trying to meet? At, at this point, at this stage, right. businesses. Okay. Okay. I, I'm, I'm gonna just sort of stop there for the short time. Okay. And then how are you gonna reach the businesses? Are they coming to you, you're coming to them? You're, to, I mean, they're. Currently, it, it's really word of mouth. Okay, it's no, I don't, mean, I don't mean how are they hearing about you. I wanna know how you're gonna serve them. Yeah. Are you? Well, are you driving a food truck to their well, job site? Like are custom you? Designing, custom designing the, the food and the package to fit the business needs and then I. I you take, deliver it? I deliver it. Okay. Deliver. So, Okay, but we could do food truck. Oops. We could do mail mm -hmm. or delivery. Or they could come to you. Now the point of this is you have a preconception of where you're going. So the, the reason for doing this is to say, okay, well that's good, put that one up. But let's look at the other ones that we're doing. So we're just gonna leave it to this. Okay, out of this, then if we're, if we're talking about businesses as your primary focus, and again, why businesses? Why not parties? Why not um, receptions or why not 
wedding dinners. I mean, yes. why, why, how did you determine who and, and, and why did you determine who they are? That's been the most successful route at this point. Okay. Have you tried others? I have tried others. At, at, how? Farmer's markets. Farmer's market? Okay. And stores. Stores? Like grocery stores? Or yeah, smaller stores. Smaller stores. Smaller stores. Okay. Okay. So, what you start to see here is the pattern that what you're doing is you're the, the first thing our, our job is, is to really delve into this. And, and to be honest, this is pretty superficial. We really need to understand more about why you're doing this. It's like the woman we were talking about who had these great ideas and then golf got in the way. So part of it is understanding really why you're trying to do this. Is it for dollars? Is it for satisfaction? Is it reputation? I mean, there are a whole series of reasons that you really need to evaluate as to why it is, because if it's for dollars, then, then ultimately as you start to evaluate, you're gonna, you're gonna do your evaluations with dollars being the higher scoring, the higher priority. If it's for reputation, that's a different kind of market. It may be that you don't make as much money, but people know if they want special, they, this is where they go. And so, to some degree, the, and the reason this is most important, there's, there's a great video that if you haven't seen, I think is worth, uh, uh, worth looking. Much. It's a YouTube video done by a guy by the name of Simon Sinek, who does a thing on marketing and, and why. He has his three circles of why you do it, how you do it, and what you do. And the, as he points out, everybody knows what they do. Some people even can tell you how they do it. And most people cannot articulate at all why they do it. And the point being that if you're going to do something, first of all, if you can articulate why, then you have a better sense of where you're going. If you can articulate why you're doing it, the people who work for you can buy into that and believe in what you're doing. And, and then from that, then you can start to figure out how the parts and pieces fall into place and how, the, uh, how you sort of evaluate these. Okay, so we're assuming right now that uh, we have a multitude of ways that we can look at things. This is probably the, the prime one. Should we ask what is it that she has as, as a question? I mean, what, what is it that you're trying to accomplish in your business? so that we can focus on that? Like, are you trying to increase sales? Or are you trying to expand uh, to a different market? Are you trying to introduce a new food product? Um, um, basically, it, it's to expand into a wholesale business. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, so, wholesale. So, so that's, your, that's your end game? Yes. Okay. And again, is it for dollar satisfaction reputation? I mean, again, there's a driver for this, and is that to make sure that the American population has the most flavorful food and starts to appreciate food? Is it that you want to make the most dollars, and so if you have really good food, you can distribute it widely and you can make more dollars, or? Is, is it also organic or gluten-free? Is Are it- there specialties? Um, and, actually, no, it's, Currently, as I go forward into the fall, it's going to be tourist. But the, the, the main focus is to get enough money, you know, to, to have a basic amount coming in every month. And this looks like the tourist uh, products are probably going to be the most successful. Okay. okay, so if we put a timeline up here, what we're saying, and again, we're kind of jumbling this, but you start to get the idea. We're starting out here, day one, day zero, with, with the new look at this. For the first year, whatever. Right, first, year. first year, year one is um, is survival, is is building up, building up. It is and marketing. I mean, basically, right product, right size, and right price. That's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what I did the first year. 
Okay, second year, third year, how long do you think it will take you to the point that you're stable? I would hope at the end of the second year there's second some stability year, there for wholesale. Year round wholesale. Okay, and so year, year two would be wholesale. Okay, now, again, part of this, if we were really going through this long term, we'd start to look through these parts and pieces and start to articulate who's the audience, how do you advertise, how do you get your word out, and is one year adequate or, or, or two years adequate to do that, and if so, what do you have to do to, to get the coverage from that? And part of that gets down to somewhere along the line, we have to take the thread of the dollars and the financing and start to say within the next six months, we think we can do X dollars, and, and six months later, we think we can do you know, twice as many no. dollars or whatever. And so all of these things start to, and, and the, the point being that we're doing this quickly. And what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's take businesses deliver um, one year, we put in advertising, we start to do, and, and, and then we have to start to take the judgment back as we start to go on through the filters and say that can happen. Well, then we can say, okay, well, maybe it's businesses drive in, pick up, and you know, and, and so you can look at the variations and say, okay, well, I wasn't really thinking that the delivery might make, but I may be able to cover more if I do, and, but it means I've got the, the cost of a delivery vehicle and I've got the whatever. So okay. Paul, I'm thinking that one of the filters then would be time, because you have a goal that by the second year you want to be wholesale. So, so one of the important filters in your case, in your business, would, be, time. would be time. Um, and then I'm assuming to reach that goal you need to have um, a certain amount of, of sales to be able to grow or expand or... And the how is really important in the food industry. I don't know about other industries, but when you're talking about how, you're talking about like mail delivery in the summer. You have to worry about the heat, so mail delivery is really out of the question. And, Really, mm -hmm. pretty much all of my products, they have to be, they have to be delivered. Okay, now. So there's so many other areas to look at. So, one of the other ways of looking at this is, I know you have your heart set on you're going to cook it, but there are the services where they mail you the ingredients and you cook it. Mm -hmm. Well, you could potentially end up with another market, sort of without, without sort of going through the whole exploration process. Where one of the other things is rather than dry, is the is the mail, uh, but it's probably not for business. Yeah, I mean it's probably for individuals, and and that that one is a mail. Now it doesn't mean you can't do this while you're doing this. If you already have all the ingredients, then it's just a matter of packaging them mm -hmm. and and putting in a recipe of how to cook it. Mm -hmm. The point being that, and in fact, do you have that article? I do. There, was, there are some articles in the, in the business journal just recently about uh, in the box. And, it, and it, it talks about food and, it, and I mean, there are companies right now that do this. Uh, they prepare it all mm -hmm. and they mail it to you for you to cook. And there are different, uh, different kinds of companies, you know, from coffee to crafts to golf accessories, oh, but it's all... Right. Um, boxed up. So again, <laughs> the point that we're trying to illustrate here is if you're locked into one path, if you're locked into one path, you may be like the railroads. You may be trying to sell insurance to the traditional family when in fact there may be another way to approach getting to your market differently. Mm -hmm. That just because everybody else has done it this way and has worked this way for a long period of time, how else could you do it? Are there things you can do online or things that you can do interactively with people in a different way? Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind if I can go off on a sure. one minute rant, uh, not rant, but <laughs> one, one minute uh, tying it into what I've been learning about is uh, at Stanford, Steve Blanks kind of coined the lean startup movement, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which uh, talks a lot about business model generation, generating mm -hmm. A uh, business model, and his premise is that in today's world, you have 
unlimited possibilities for business models. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of the, uh, the concepts revolve around validating your business model with customers to make sure that it actually works. If it doesn't, then to scrap it. But mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. the literature isn't particularly strong on developing a new business model if your previous one was not able to be validated successfully. And, and so this looks like a great method for identifying new possibilities mm -hmm. that you hadn't previously considered. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a great tool. And yeah. Stanford has the D-Lab, where basically it approaches things from the, this venue. D-School, 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 which is uh, the School of Innovation. Harvard and Business School uses this, now teaches this kind of an approach. Grab Harvard Business Review. There are articles on design thinking constantly in there. There yeah. are a lot of publications on it. You know, th and, this and, is and I think you have a really good point, a really valid point that most businesses, when we're starting up, we have limited resources. And so you have to be creative about how you can grow, how you can meet your customers' needs without having to grow that fast because there are no resources for that. Like in our case, we were also having the conundrum of how do we make sure we have staff, we have people, available in case we get a bigger project, but we cannot pay for their salaries right now. So how do we do that? Turns out we knew a few people who had to go back to their countries of origin during the downturn that had already worked with Paul, had been in the state, so they knew the systems, they knew our, our software, and we connected with them. They said, we're, we're good to go, we can work online. Our software allows us to share the same drawing at the same time. So, so that was one of the ideas that came out of something like that. So like, part of how our, else do we? Part of our staff lives in Argentina, and part of it lives in Guinea. Yeah. But so it's it's the idea of. Uh, I, I mean, this is not a magic panacea, but it's a different way of looking at it. And I think the the, the what Callie's saying is right. We face the same problem, and so we do. Our whole office is focused on a whiteboard. I mean, obviously, we, we do everything on the whiteboard. I will tell you that there, there is a great deal to the visual piece of it. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that I learned, and again, I, I fell into this by chance. I started this when I was asked by an architectural firm in Hawaii to come help them think out of the box for the school districts over there. And so I went over and I helped them and created a couple of ideas and then state asked me to come back and do another school with another group and so I did that one and pretty soon I was realizing that I had de facto uh, helped them make their decisions the same way we make decisions in design. You come up with, you've got all these problems to solve, you figure out 15 different ways you can solve it and you figure out which one's the best one. Well, the idea being that you cannot be stuck if you're going to be successful on one answer. The second part of it is everybody is visual. And even if you are a statistician, if you put it up there and you start to get people, I, this is, I realized that my previous firm was a large firm. So we had a conference room that was about from that wall to the clock over there. And we had a couple of walls in it that were whiteboards. And I was doing strategic planning for different organizations that I was involved with. I'm on a charter school board, I mean, you know, whatever. And we do these strategic plans and so I just doing my thing. And I realized how quickly People who were not trained in this came from all different walks of life because they're all board members who were just brought onto the board. We can make decisions, and, and it was amazing to watch. Somebody would say, well, you know, over here we were talking about this, and here we we're talking about this, and here we we're talking about this. If we put those three things together this way, we can come up with a new idea. And what it amounts to is everybody will remember, if, if I start drawing a diagram and you see that diagram later, the conversation we have about that diagram is gonna come back to you. It is amazing how that works. It's like there was a thing on NPR today that was talking about Alzheimer's and music and how music can actually help people remember things back with that music. We're convinced that the visual things, if you put it up on a board and you have three people sitting around the table and you start doing all these things and somebody's gonna come up with this diagram that says this and this and you know, this and over here. Well, six, six weeks later, you can come back and, and people will remember that discussion. And in reality, it's not just us. We have also read some articles on neuroscience. And the reality is that our 
two sides of the brain think differently, right? One is language, one is holistic, more images and whatnot. So when you start doing this process, the two sides of, of, of the brain start to engage, which really helps you to create innovation and generate just out of the box solutions. Yeah, you're, 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 you're uh, yeah, excuse me. So TED talk uh, about memory champions and there's this uh, reporter who went to report on the memory championship and then a year later, after having used the techniques, he actually won it, and it's a great TED Talk, but they used uh, a concept called memory palaces, where they're walking through a palace and there will be a dog, and the dog will remind them of one thing, and then the dog trips over the rug, and then falls into a bathtub, and each thing has a specific, you know, it's visual, but he talks mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how every major tool that they use as memory athletes, they call themselves, mm, um, special. involved around visual memory. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to remember, your right brain is, is, the, is the one where all the abstractions occur. It has no language. Your left brain is where language occurs. And so we'll be doing all this stuff. Meanwhile, and it's going into your left brain because that's where you communicate. Meanwhile, your right brain is, is filtering all of this stuff. And so what happens when you see this your, your, uh, your right brain is saying, um, or your left brain is saying, I remember the conversation with this. Your right brain is already processed and is thinking about what the impacts of that are. And it's the old thing, your, your, uh, your right brain will tell your gut that that makes sense and you can't explain it because your, your left brain, where language is, isn't as connected, but you know it's the right answer. This is all playing on that same, same vantage point, that it is really taking advantage of the power of the brain in a different way than you typically do. Everybody can go step one, step two, step three, step four. Now, I, I, as, as architects and planners, one of the things that I bridle at, and maybe I get myself in trouble since we're here at the city, Planners have a tendency to, to put something up the wall and they put numbers on it, one, two, three, four, five. And the one who gets the, the most things on it wins because that's the one that your left brain can re-articulate the kinds of things you're talking about. But if somebody can get up and describe why they put one on this one over here and they can build a story to explain it, it clicks and you understand why they did it. Now, the mass um, uh, right brain will, I mean left brain will just one, two, three, four, add them up, there's the number. It, it is not create, it's not the creative solution. What we're trying to do is to create an innovation intervention. The idea is we're trying to intervene in people's thought processes to make them look at the various iterations that could happen and the various combinations. Uh, unfortunately, this whiteboard's about a sixteenth the size it really needs to be to do this. But it's the idea that you just start putting this stuff across. You can erase anything you don't like. You know, if it doesn't work, put it up there, make it five years. You know, um, typically we use a lot of color, which I didn't do this time because we're trying to. Because ultimately, again, one of the other things is if I start saying. Um, all of a sudden those have hierarchies. And so there are some techniques and things that we use in that process. But the bottom line is that it is a way for you to take the step back, start out with why you're doing this, what it is you're trying to accomplish. Make sure you're not a railroad industry, you're a transportation business. Make sure that you understand why you're trying to do it. First of all, because if you understand the why, you will carry it through. If you're doing it because you've seen somebody else do it this way and your success chances are 50-50 at best uh, because it's, it's not you. You're taking what you think somebody else did and if you don't do it exactly the way you did and have the same success, but if you have a reason why you're trying to do this, nobody's gonna get in your way because you're committed to doing it. So if you can get back to the why and then start to go through the process steps um, it, it all starts to fall in place. I don't know if we if want to take more time into um, 
doing more more for your type of question or if somebody else has another question another uh, example that we can walk through and do a quick yeah. how is uh, balancing the various components and scarcities fit into the design concept oh it, it, it's absolutely critical it, yeah. in other words part of the you know if, if we had the the slides back up here there are all these filters and so you come up with all these crazy ideas. You may come up with, you know, if you're really excited, you can come with 25 different ideas, three of which you're going to look at and you're going to say, Psst, you know, we, we, intuitively, we know that ours aren't going to meet it. The rest of them, you may start to work them through the filters to say, time doesn't work, something else doesn't work. Those may not get thrown out, but they get put off to the side. The, the value of that is, there's always a nugget somewhere in one of these that you're going to bring back in, but... Um, and the filters are really specific to your situation or your business. Um, for instance, in this case, the filter, one of the biggest filters would be um, time and, and money. Right. So... But, but you're also going to talk about social... I mean, the social structure of what you create, both within your business, with your staff, and with your customers. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that we focus on is, we say if you're designing a building, what you really need to do is design the social structure that you want to have in there and then put a building around it that doesn't get in the way. So that if, if people, if you want people to really congregate in an area and interchange with things serendipitously, you can design it that way. You just need to make sure the building doesn't get in the way of doing it. So it really is the same thing with a, with a business or a strategy. Mm -hmm. So all of the parts and pieces Everyone's unique, but it's got to do with people, it's got to do with money, it's got to do with time, it's got to do with regulation, it's got to do with, I mean, they're, they're just a series that you're going to do automatically. And then health department, you know, I mean, yeah. there are all these things that sort of get in the, in the pattern. Other questions? I'm not sure we answered yours well enough, but. I have more of a statement on a question, I think. Um, left brain, right brain, um, don't dismiss the left side, the logic side. No, 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 absolutely not. Yeah, and I, and I see this, you know, the creative side, it's really, really right. important. And once you pick out, to me, it's the facts, the factors that are involved in the, your company and the awareness. That's all you, you put up factual awareness on a board. And now you're going to look for the shortcuts to go back to the process of one, two, three, four, because the logic has to start right. doing Correct. one, two, three. You don't start in the middle of what I'm looking on my board. You, no. You need to have the left brain logic to proceed I, No, I disagree with you with I think what you're starting with. You have to start with the right brain. You start with the right brain because that's what gives you the possibilities. The left brain is the one that does the filtering and does the assessment. And it, you, it's true, you absolutely, and when you get to a certain point, if you you're not using your left that. brain to figure out the, the specific strategies and processes, you're not going to make it. The left brain is where the word marketing, the word sales, the, the basic economics of any business comes from. Yeah. The creative side on the right mm. filters from the left. Mm -hmm. I, I would disagree with you. Okay. I, I, I think the, the point is, the problem is, as soon as you start to, to list those specific things as, as givens, mm -hmm. you've eliminated the potential of some of the options. And so what we're suggesting is those are absolutely important and they are part of... But if I say marketing and you're saying they're givens, there's many ways to market. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and we're and not... That, that comes from the left brain. Yeah. Brain. Correct. Right. And yeah. we're not, we're not discounting creativity within a business is right brain. But, but I, the two have to mesh. Correct. No, no, they have to mesh well, without question. One of the things in our last slide, I don't know if you noticed, that it says once you have gone through all your iterations and all the possibilities, then you start filtering and you pick a winner. And after you pick the winner, then you do your marketing process or your um, pr uh, service, you know, your operations and manual. I don't know, whatever needs to happen that is, that belongs to the left, I mean to the right brain in terms of step one, step two, step three. But that is after you have completed this, this the more loose uh, process. Mm -hmm. That a gentleman from Stanford, that 
was creative, but he saw it from the structure itself. He saw it from, you know, how how business, uh, how why startups fail, mm -hmm. why eight out of ten fail, mm -hmm. and one breaks even and one makes money, and then so he had a, he tapped into his creative side and came up with this process, which was, you know, the, the right brain oriented. And what we're saying is, there's a step before that would ensure it better. Let me, let me answer that and then I'll come back to that. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I actually agree with you. Um, I think that the traditional approach is always to have like a very structured sort of document that says, you know, these are my goals, what are the resources that I need to put into it, whether it's resource people, whether it's, um, mm -hmm. you know, equipment, whatever it is, whatever type of resources you need to use. So I think that's the very traditional approach. I don't think that that's the way that life and business is going now. Um, and I think, you know, what, you, what, what you're talking about now, what Jean is talking about is exactly like Steve Jobs and Wozniak. Wozniak was all about, you know, um, I want to create this, I want to share it with everybody else. And Steve Jobs was like, no, we're going to like put this into a business model and sell it. I think mm -hmm. both ways work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a company. I actually know that for myself, because I'm a very structured person. I sit down and then I write out all the documents and I write out the business plan and all of that stuff. And I think a lot of the times if you do it that way, it doesn't mean that you're going to work. I think there could be someone who wants to do exactly the same thing as you and they don't use the structured approach, the mm -hmm. traditional approach exactly. that you go to university and they teach you is going to work. And they're actually more successful than you mm -hmm. because um, they follow completely through on the process that you started off with in the very beginning, the why of the goals. Correct. Okay, and and let, me, let me just say, I think it, there's no question, ultimately it has to be a balance. What we're saying is right now the balance has been shifted towards the analytic approach to it. It's, if I go back to the school that I was talking about earlier, part of what we're trying to do is to get the part before you start to analyze how you're gonna put the school together. What we're saying is maybe there are a dozen different ways that you could run an educational process. You just have to take the step back. Then you, absolutely, it has to come back. If you don't, if you don't have the, the, the business strategy structure piece, it's not gonna work. Mm -hmm. The problem is that's been what we have put all mm -hmm. the weight on. Mm -hmm. You take the design thinking process and then you get to a certain point and you put that in. Your chances of success, I think, are almost 100%. Well, we yeah. It's interesting. The, uh, you know, if you look back at the 20th century and uh, the lean movement, it's definitely not an entrepreneurial thing. It's more of a streamline, streamlining, eliminating waste. Mm -hmm. you know, essentially uh, came from Toyota. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really took it in high gear and gave it to the rest of us. Now we have Kaizen and, and all the other different ones. But, uh, you know, you brought up, uh, you know, the right brain and the left brain. But I think that what I was getting at earlier is that we have this nice format that is the nuts and bolts of how to do the lean startup process or rapid startup. And I don't think that they do particularly well the vision creation. And, right. and what you're saying exactly. is that we need a vision, and he's saying we need the nuts and bolts. You have to have both. Both, both. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Personality theory tells us that 80% of the people out there are like you. That's They're what I was detailed say. people. I wasn't <laughs> Most oh, I'm sorry. Are like you, or they, you know, they like but having I'm things close. structured. And I get people who don't like that. I get yeah. people who are like, I don't want this document of how to do the business plan and so forth. And that's how I got to learn. It depends on the person. Some people want to go through this process and then hire someone who's going to do the part that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and because they're more organic, that's what I've just learned. Is some people, I, I was speaking, I was working with a lady in New York today, I was coaching her, and she said, no. She said, I don't work with lists. Don't give me a list of things that I must do and then the next time we speak. She said, I'm not going to do that. Well, and I, she's, she's going to go and work in Kenya. So huh. what that shows me is that the traditional approach does not always work. And there's some people who are going to, it's going to be repulsive. Well, and another uh, point that we were trying to make was that your your observation that it is it is a norm. More most businesses, that's how they evolve. They from from a structure from the tradition. What we are saying is that if you if you want to offer something different than your competition, this is. For us, it has proven to be a good process Agreed. because all of a sudden you start thinking outside the box and you start thinking of, oh, what are the other ways that I can offer the same service but maybe just differently? Like one of the pro um, businesses that we found out, my husband and I just recently found out, is called Blue Apron. 
and apparently it's a monthly subscription. Uh, they mail you all the ingredients and they give you the recipe and they mail you the exact portion of your ingredients and you just have to cook it. So then, I mean, who would have thought that that would be a business, right? But for people that are so busy working that want to get home and they still, they still want, want to enjoy, <laughs> they, still, they still want good food, they still want to cook, uh, they want you know, healthy stuff, they don't want to have to go out, uh, that is a good solution. So it's all a matter of all the possibilities that are out there. And, and again, I think what, what, what we're seeing, what we're reading, uh, it probably reinforces kind of the way we think. So we're biased, there's no question about it, we're, we are. But if I go back to the school illustration, if I were starting a school and I were doing it as most people who start charter schools now, they find a place that they can fit kids in. Usually they start thinking in terms of classroom size spaces. They start to hire teachers. They develop a curriculum and they put it together and assume it will work. But there are schools now, we just visited some in San Francisco that were design thinking schools where all of the students are, all of their curriculum is based on them doing hands-on projects. It's, it's much more of a tangible hands-on kind of thing. And so they have laboratories and the kids in the fourth grade have drills and power tools in their classroom. And so if you're thinking about a traditional school, it's true, you can sit down and you can figure out a very efficient way to do it. The question is, if you're really trying to educate students, first question you need to ask is, just because we've been teaching people this way doesn't mean it's the way kids learn. We now know so much more about how kids learn. So it's the same thing with whatever it is you do. Well, let's take a step back. The creative way, though, when you mentioned the example of school, would be to teach online. Not necessarily. One tool, absolutely. One creative tool. Absolutely. It doesn't exist. I mean, it exists, but it's marginal. I mean, it hasn't taken off the way it could. Right. But, 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 you know, it's almost like, you know, when you start off with talking about design in school, you've already bypassed the economics. You haven't talked about the affordability. It's almost like Obamacare without sounding politics. You can't put something in place because it sounds good without the basic ingredients oh, no. of economics. You have to. left side. Thank well, you. yeah, the, the point is, you know, in, in, in well, a school that starts out from design thinking, this is the whole school. And maybe what you do is you end up in a place in here where you've got some, some lab stations and you've got open spaces in here and you end up with a little place where you can do music here and you, and so it's not classrooms. You still have to figure out how much it's going to cost you, what it's going to cost you to operate it. Which is All of those. Which is traditional. It's Correct. traditional. And that's where the filters was come in. I trying to make my point was, you need both. Absolutely. That's what and, I was trying that's to That's exactly yeah. what and, we're saying, too. And, and, we and agree really, with you. <laughs> it's the filter process that gets us back to pretty much that analytical piece, because if you're not analyzing it, you're jumping in blind, you're dead. Yeah, Absolutely dead. What we're just trying to do is push you a Two notch years. further. Just as well, I apologize to me. If, if I had sat through this a year ago when I first started, I would have had no idea how to write all this or, or which direction to go in. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, almost a year into this, much better. I mean, I have a better concept sure. of, of all this stuff. So it's almost like you want to do this and you want to do this on a routine basis mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to really look. It's like changing your business plan every six months or mm -hmm. changing your sales mm -hmm. plan every six months. Look at it because so much more information and, and more ability to understand Correct. all of this and, and where other directions you can go in instead of just trying to do it right off the bat. And mm -hmm. if you put it up where you can see it and look at it and leave it up and come back and think about it, it will help you even more. I. Quite frankly, one of the greatest tools that has ever been invented in my mind is the whiteboard. I will tell <laughs> you, I think that it has been, I mean, we, I mean I've done this, I, I, can I say this? I am the public person on the Department of Corrections, Corrections Industries Oversight Committee. They were trying to figure out some strategies on how to increase because it's a great program. And, and the Corrections Industries is, is a program. Prisons part of the prisons programs that teaches inmates skills so when they get out of jail they're able to find a job they either welding or baking or carpentry uh, and, and it's a very make, successful program. They also make money that they get back to the prison system. Well anyway that, that's I, and I don't want to get too far into that because I may get in trouble but but the point <laughs> being had all these guys who are just hardline technical kind of people 
what we did is when we went through this process, we realized that part of their dilemma was they were trying to figure out how to expand it. It was partly because of their marketing program. And so we went through all these kinds of things, trying to figure out how we could rearrange and stack things and put things together and so forth. And then we realized that one of the key things they had was trying to figure out how to get people to market differently to be able to have uh, different industries be able to utilize their services. It's, it, is, it is helpful for everybody in even the most analytical things. I mean, even if you're an accountant, the idea of being able to put up the big strategies, you still got to go through all the numbers. But it's really a matter of, I mean, if you're selling insurance, trying to present, I mean, start putting down who you're trying to sell to, why, you're try, why do you believe in it, why, why are you doing it, how could you do it, how many different ways could you pr present it, how have you seen other people do it, and start to filter through what works for you and how you put it together. Then you got to do the hard work of making it happen and figuring out how to make that happen. So it really, it, it's ir irrelevant what the business is. We use this for design. I mean, we, we do the same thing when we're working on a building. But it, it is really simply trying to take a step backwards, look at a bigger picture so you're not a railroad, and figure out all the different ways you could do transportation. Maybe you're one of the new Uber cabs, or maybe you're, you know, Lyft. whatever. We were talking, maybe the example we should use is if you had a taxi company right now, how would you compete with Uber cabs? Well, okay, well, first thing you have to do is start to think, well, okay, what are they doing? Well, they're doing, you know, GPS, GPS. you know, buzz it in and come pick it. Well, why can't taxis do that? I mean, what are the, what is the service you're trying to provide and how are you trying to provide it? So it's, it's, it's not magic, it's just being willing to take the step back. The thing that's interesting, when you get a really complex thing and you start to fill up a board and you take a break and you come back the next day, you don't want to raise that board. And so, you know, ultimately, no, it's just, I, I, I encourage anybody, any place, if you have an opportunity, get a whiteboard. <laughs> and then use it to put up what you learned from the last time and start to go backwards and say, okay, this is what I started with. Where do I, what do I think I'm trying to do now? I mean, what is my, what is my goal now? Because I have some, I have some distance under my belt. It changes. It changes. It changes. And so, and, mm -hmm. but then that will start to give you some clues as to who your customers might be, where you start to present it, how you start to present it, and what the options are. And you may start out by saying, we're going this way, but in the back of my head, I've got three other options here that I'm going to keep those in the back of my head that if I start to see this working, maybe I'll have the resource to do this. If this is not working, maybe I can shift gears and, and do this. And so it gives you the opportunity that you may be going this way, but at some point here, there are some options that you can do two or three other iterations of it. You know, you may do it hand delivered now. You may do it by, by delivery truck. You may do it by food truck. You may do it by, you know, somewhere down the line. And, and so those options are still there, being consistent with what you started with. Have we talked to you guys to death? <laughs> Obviously, we, we just think this is it's just a, a great tool for everyone. And we uh -huh. just, you know, we're available to help. I mean, if somebody really wants to do it, we actually do this for a living. But we're, you know, if you have a question or something like that and you're trying to do something, we're a resource. Uh, you know, just call us and ask us. Or if you're stuck on something, throw it up. I mean, we just like to brainstorm. So. We do it for fun. Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? We probably. Any last uh, questions or? I have one last question. Okay. Uh, you just you seem to keep pointing to at the end you're going to have just one solution. I know you talk about put cell on the side. Is it okay to keep two? Sure. Or three? Absolutely. Right. That, the, uh, as long as you can validate that there is a there is a way to make them happen. I mean, it's true. You can end up with three things that come out of this in different ways. They may be tied together or they may yeah. be separate. Okay. Sure. I mean, this is just a tool. It's just a methodology. The key to it is the step backwards. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the 90% of this. The rest of it, okay. you know, it, it's, it's going down through the list. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>
Scottsdale's Economic Development Department can help your business grow strong in one of the nation's most dynamic cities. For more information, visit ChooseScottsdale.com or call 480-312-7989.